Gauss's Law. We'll start this video by talking about fields and charges because there's some important points I want to make about field lines. We'll then derive Gauss's Law, which is essentially just two different ways of calculating total charge throughout a volume, and we set those equal. We arrive at Gauss's Law in integral form, and then real quick, we can convert that to differential form. When it comes to calculating electric fields around electric charges, this should be done through the electric flux density D. And in many textbooks, they'll present equations like this, but they'll use the electric field intensity E, and then sometimes there's an epsilon here, sometimes there's not, and it's always confusing and unclear what assumptions have been built into that. Fundamentally, it's electric flux that exists around charge, We'll calculate this through D, and the equation you see here will hold and be valid always. This is an equation we'll discuss later. I just wanted to briefly mention that. So if we have an electric charge, these electric field lines will diverge, or they'll start at positive charge and point away from positive charge. Similarly, if we have a negative charge, those field lines will also be straight, same orientation, but they will point inward. So you could say that the electric field lines will start on positive charges and end on negative charges. This is even more obvious when we introduce both a negative and positive charge together. And we can see the field lines clearly starting at the positive charge and converging to the negative charge. In terms of field lines, if the charge is a very small charge, we would draw more sparsely spaced field lines. If it's a strong or large charge, we would have these field lines spaced much more densely. And this is also useful because as we move away from the charge, you can see that the field lines are more sparse. And in fact, we will see that the field decays with distance away from charge and drawing the field lines like this also conveys that. Now some notes on these field lines. We always draw field lines around charges and in some ways it's unfortunate and it's also very misleading because when we draw field lines, what this seems to imply is that somehow there's an electric field here but not over here. And it makes us think that the field is somehow discrete or connected in these lines and stringy in some sense, and it's not that at all. So this is a, a wrong picture, and I think the concept of electric field lines takes us down this path, and we're visualizing the electric fields incorrectly from the very beginning. The electric field is a smooth and continuous phenomena. Think clouds or fog. That is much more like what electric fields look like. And so I'm trying to draw that with this gray sort of shaded reason. And it's stronger, closer to the charge. So we see a thicker, more dense cloud. And it gets weaker as we move away. Now, we like to somehow keep track of the directionality of the field. And that's where these field lines come in. We just sort of artificially follow the direction of the fields and draw a line as we walk along those directions. But the field line itself is not a physical thing. It's something that we do to help us try to visualize the fields. But in your minds, when you're visualizing electric fields and magnetic fields, when we get to them, think of these as these smooth, continuous clouds. Let's move on to Gauss's law in integral form. Suppose we have some charge, and I'm drawing it as a circle or an ellipse here, but it could be some other odd shape. There's two ways that we can calculate the total charge within that volume. The first way is integrating the flux. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means. We already know the stronger this charge, we'll get more field lines or more densely spaced field lines coming out of here. 
positive charge will go outward, negative charge will go inward. So we already sort of know there's a relationship between these field lines and the charge in here that is creating them. So in fact, mathematically, if we enclose this charge in some surface, this has to be a perfectly closed surface that encloses the charge. If we integrate the electric flux through this surface, we will be calculating the total enclosed charge. Remember what flux is. It's the component of the vector field that is perfectly perpendicular to the surface. So we ignore tangential components of the field. So if we go around and just look at the perpendicular components that I'm showing in blue, ignoring the tangential components, and we integrate that all the way around, what we get is the total charge that is enclosed by the surface where we did our integration. So mathematically, we write it this way, total charge is a surface integral. So it's a double integral and the little circle here is reminding us this is a closed surface. It has to perfectly enclose a volume. And over this surface S1, we integrate the electric flux. Now I've set this equal to a different surface because in fact, it does not matter what surface we choose or what shape, as long as it perfectly encloses that charge. So here's a new surface, S2, completely different surface, different path, and we still will get the total charge, the same total charge that's enclosed in this case in both S1 and S2. So the choice of surface does not matter. So if we're ever forced to do this calculation, well, we would choose a surface that is the easiest to mathematically integrate the electric flux. So this is half of Gauss's law in integral form. There is a second way to calculate the total charge enclosed within a surface. Now here, instead of thinking along the surface of these surfaces we've defined, let's think about integrating through the volume. It turns out if we integrate the electric charge density throughout the same volume that was enclosed by the surfaces we just talked about, we will also calculate total charge. So mathematically, we could write it this way. Now we're talking about triple integrals over the volume, integrating the charge density throughout the volume V1. It doesn't matter which volume we choose, as long as that volume completely encloses the charge that we're talking about, we will always get that same total charge. We just talked through two different ways of calculating the total charge enclose within some volume. And so Gauss's law, we set these equal. And here's how I like to write Gauss's law. This Q equals is not really part of Gauss's law. I like to write that there to remind us that what we've done is two different ways, calculate total enclosed charge. Method one, we're integrating the flux around a surface that encloses that charge. And in method two, we're integrating throughout the volume in the surface, we're integrating the electric charge density. Both ways lead to the same total charge. So this is Gauss's law in integral form. Now let's derive Gauss's law in differential form. And to do this, we're going to apply the divergence theorem. Let's quickly remember what the divergence theorem was. It's a way that we can convert a closed contour surface integration of flux into a volume integral of divergence. So here's Gauss's law as we've written it up to this point where we've set our two methods of calculating total enclosed charge. We can integrate flux over a closed contour surface or we can integrate charge density throughout a volume. Well, here is a closed contour surface integration of flux, and we can use the divergence theorem to convert that to a volume charge integral of divergence. So that's exactly what we do. Now we have total charge is two different volume integrals giving us the same answer.
So if we have two volume integrals giving us the same answer, it makes sense then that the arguments of those volume integrals should be the same. That has to mean that the divergence of the electric flux has to be the same thing as the volume charge density. So if we set those equal, that is Gauss's law in differential form.